All right, all right. So some of you have moved in the last two or three years. It's been like the great migration um, over the last few years. We moved to North Carolina, a ton of people moving to Texas, basically people moving to states that aren't completely horrendous and mismanaged. Um, and where they land, um, a lot of times uh, they don't necessarily have a church. Now, here's the thing. I never recommend somebody moves uh, without moving for a church. Uh now, a lot of people move for jobs. They move just because they believe God has spoken to them. And all, all that's well and good. But you need to first find a church. That should be the number one priority. Whenever we get somewhere, um, we've moved a few times. Um, both times we moved to New York and Southern California was for church. When, even when I moved to Australia, it was for church for Bible college. Um, but you need to find that first. First thing I do is find a church. Then I find a gym. And then all is well with the world. So I kind of go from there, right? I found my little keystone habits that I need to get in place. But I want to help you, even if you haven't moved um, recently or within the last couple of years, to find a church, right? Finding a good church. What does it actually look like to find a good church? Now, the way that we did it here in North Carolina is uh, we started one. <laughs> we wanted a church that we like to go to, a church that we enjoyed, um, a church that was the best church in North Carolina. So we started one. <laughs> we love Salt Church. We love the people. It's been an amazing ride so far. It's only been about eight months, but so far things have been incredible. Now, I want to give you some maybe parameters or call them guidelines to finding a church. First thing you need to realize, and I know everybody says this and it's a tired phrase, but the church is never going to be perfect, right? Until Jesus comes back and restores all things. So you can never expect to find a certain church. You need to have some non-negotiables when it comes to a church. It's not like shopping for a house. It's not like shopping for something. The first thing that you need to do, first thing you need to do before you shop, before you start acting like a consumer for your church, because so many Americans go around picking churches based on whether they like the preaching, they like the teaching, they like the worship, they like the blah, blah, blah. They like the outward expression of the faith. When God in the Bible, we see him call people to churches, and then they don't leave those churches. <laughs> they are called to churches. Unless there's a sending, right? We don't see people leaving churches. We see Paul and Barnabas get sent from Antioch, right? But they get sent by a group of people, hands are laid on them, and they're sent out. Just leaving a church can be detrimental to your future. I'm going to give you reasons for leaving a church by the end of this video, right? So we're going to get a little spicy with that, but I want to first help you how help you figure out how to actually just find one. All right. Number one, number one thing to finding a church. It's a biblical church. It does what the Bible says. It actually preaches the Bible, not what they think the Bible is supposed to say, not what culture says around them, but you're hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Let me read to you out of the book of Acts. This gives us some parameters as to how a church actually functions right when the church started. So this is Acts chapter two. And we're going to start actually with verse 40. This is right after Peter preaches a message, likely on Solomon's porch, but it doesn't matter exactly where he preached it. But the first thing that happened in the church is the Holy Spirit came down and then Peter preached a message. So 40, and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those that had received his word were baptized and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. So the first thing we see happen in the church, the first thing that happens is the Holy Spirit descends, right? So the Holy Spirit's involved in this church. But what happens when the Holy Spirit comes down? They speak in other tongues, right? Draws attention, right? People are hearing the great works of God. So worship is happening, right? They're hearing the great works of God spoken in their own native languages. And then Peter gets up to preach, so Peter lays out the gospel. What we have in Acts is likely a, an abbreviated version of that message, right? Because it says he kept on exhorting them, be saved from this wicked generation. The first thing that happens is the gospel is preached. So there's preaching in your church, all right? There's preaching in your church of the gospel of Jesus. The focus is Jesus. In the book of Acts, all the way through, the message is Jesus. If you have a church, right, that is consistently giving tips for a better life, that's not the gospel. 
They're eating around the gospel. That's the outcome of the gospel many times. A better life many times is the outcome of the gospel. At least a fulfilled life is the outcome of the gospel. Sometimes life just gets drastically worse externally once you get saved and hear the gospel. But many times, right, in our Western context, right, when you follow the principles of the gospel, life tends to get better for now, right? But you hear the gospel preached. Preaching is central to the church, Preaching is central to the church, right? That's the pulpits in the middle, right? And that's just a a symbol of it. But the preaching of the word is central to the church. Now, it's not the only thing going on in church, right? And the preacher is not the point. The preacher is the messenger of the gospel. The preacher brings the message of Jesus. But there is biblical preaching in your church. And here's how you can tell there's biblical preaching in your church. You went into church, your pastor preached a message from somewhere in scripture. Maybe you haven't heard before. Maybe you've read before. And he's right, but you disagree with him. He's right, but it ruffled your feathers. He's right, but you're frustrated when you leave church. A lot of times people set up church in a way that they're like, like, uh, I want to leave church with people happier than when they came in, right? <laughs> I want sometimes for people to leave church wondering what they're doing with their lives, right? What am I supposed to do with this information? That was a heavy message. I, I need to think about this. I need to be a Berean like Paul Paul runs into in the book of Acts. I, we need to divide this scripture in my household. I need to talk to my wife and my kids about this. I need to get together with some group of friends and really hash this out, right? Because because he, the pastor was right, but I don't know why I disagreed with him. And if I lived by this principle and I lived by what he was preaching when it came, came to the gospel, you know, maybe I'm not as sold out as I thought I was. Maybe I'm not as bought in as I thought, as, thought I was. You need to be challenged by the gospel consistently. And another thing we see, people are getting saved. Churches are reaching people right? Churches are consistently reaching people. 3,000 were added on the first day of the church. So there's always an appeal for people to repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus, to be saved from this wicked generation. If they're just telling you you're great, if they're just telling you you're awesome, honestly, there's nothing, there's nothing more discouraging to me as a man than going into a church and being told how awesome I am, because I know I'm not. Tell me how to live a better life. Tell me how to follow Jesus better. Tell me what I need to fix. Honestly, I can get, a, there's a thousand billion million sources out there that can tell me how great I am. I can get onto a mastermind in 30 seconds and pay the money and someone is getting paid to tell me how incredible I am. I'm not talking about being self-deprecating, but we can always improve. We can always aim higher. We can always aim for eternity. That's what I want to hear. I want to hear from the gospel how I'm not aligning with scripture and then get handles on how to do it. All right, I'm going to continue reading here. So verse 41, they received his word and were baptized and that day were added 3,000 souls. Verse 42, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Right. So they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, what we would see as the Bible, right? The Word of God. They're they're attaching themselves and devoting themselves to the teachings of Jesus that are coming through the apostles, right? So dedicated to the Word. You want to find a church that's dedicated to the Word, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You want to see people hanging out together, being together, enjoying each other, right? You don't want to go to a cold church that has no relationship. They're breaking the bread, but what are they breaking the bread around? Around Jesus. You may be in a church where nobody in that church would normally be your friend in regular life, but you sit down at a table and you eat of the same body and drink of the same blood that was shed for you. And there's a supernatural love that takes place. And that's why we see the church dedicated to breaking bread together. People should be eating together. People should be naturally hanging out together. It should be fun, right? You're going to want to go back. All right, and to prayer. You need to have a prayerful church, a church that is praying to Jesus for supernatural power. A lot of times, if you don't have prayer in a church, what you get is strategy and corporatism alone. There's nothing wrong with strategy, but it needs to come from God first. There's nothing wrong with planning ahead, but it needs to be able to be interrupted by Jesus through prayer. There needs to be a prayerful culture in the church. 
Jesus consistently and constantly prayed. You can refer to, to my secret place video that we just put up, but Jesus constantly prayed. You need to have a church that has a, a culture of corporate prayer, right? And sometimes this is hard to get started. Sometimes it's been hard in our church to get it started, right? But that church needs to be beseeching God for victory, right? Beseeching God for the lost, asking him what to do next. Verse 43, and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, right? So a sense of awe, let's call that worship, right? The number one mission of the church is to worship God. That's what the people of God did in the Old Testament. That's what the new people of God do in the New Testament. The church, they worship God. They worship God first. If your church is focused, and I'm not talking about having a perfect worship band. I'm talking about a culture of worship, right? We're like a startup church. And I came from like the Hillsong world, right? God rest their soul. I came from the Hillsong world. But worship was so important to that church. And excellence was so important to that church, right? In worship. And I think it's one of their keys to success that they had was worship was central, lifting up God, lifting up his name, making Jesus the center of the focus, right? One of the other cultural things we do in our church, which I think you should look for in other churches, are the songs that you're singing glorifying God, or are they glorifying you? Your faith, your goodness, what you do. Is it humanism that's snuck into the worship? Or are you worshiping Jesus and how great he actually is? Right? A lot of people want the Holy Spirit to come down on their services. I find that when Jesus is glorified, the Holy Spirit visits the service. Right? So worship is the first thing the church does. The second thing the church does is equip the saints, right? And we see that in being attached to the word. How do you equip the saints? Through the Bible, through a heavenly way of thinking, through thinking like the kingdom, through having the mind of Christ, through washing people in the water of the word, raising families, having marriages, you know, dating, money, jobs. All those things are inside the kingdom. They're not separate from your church. So you need to have a church that's equipping you to do all those things by getting to the core of who you are. That's equipping the saints. Find a church that equips you. And everyone was kept, kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Now this one is really important. Are miracles happening in the church? Miracles are biblical. Are miracles taking place? Notable miracles taking place. This is something if you don't have in your church and you're called to it, you should be seeking. If you're a pastor, you should be seeking. Miracles were happening all the time. Miracles were happening all the time. I prayed for someone in church three weeks ago, a woman that's been coming to our church for months. And I was like, if I, I felt the Holy Spirit lead to talk about physical healing. She came to the front. She had a hearing problem, right? She has to listen to my messages on YouTube with headphones on because she can't hear me in church, right? But she's still there every single Sunday. I'm like, that's wild. I pray for her and her ears open and she can hear her husband and she can hear me preach in church on Sundays, right? She can hear the worship. She can engage, right? Her ears open. She's like, I couldn't hear that before. Now I can hear that. Even with the speaker blaring right behind us with piano music, she could hear me directly talking to her face, and that wasn't possible before. There need to be notable miracles taking place in your church on a regular basis. Verse 44, and all of those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. All right, you need to find a church that's generous. Find a church with generous people in it. And if you're going to join a church, you need to be generous yourself, right? A lot of people like to say, well, we're the church. We're the church. We're the church. Okay, if you're the church, then every problem that you see on a Sunday and throughout the week is your problem. Not your pastor's problem, not the leadership. It's your problem. If you're part of the body, what part are you playing to invest your time, your energy, your money? in order to see that problem absolutely fixed. Take responsibility for the church that you join. So we noted a lot of things there in finding a church. Last thing, is God asking you to go to a church? Is he calling you to a church? If he's calling you to a church, not to be a missionary to that church, but to submit to the leadership in that church and expand the kingdom in that body of believers, right? Being a missionary to a church is a, is a recipe for, for failure. 
Is God calling you to it? Have you prayerfully considered it? And once you've prayerfully considered it, committing to that body of believers, not based on how you feel or what you think, but committing to that body of believers. All right. Now, reasons to leave. (laughs) Why would you leave a church? Why would you ever leave a church? I've left churches before. I left Australia. So I left Hillsong in Australia. I left uh, our church in New York City to plant a new church in Southern California. So why would you ever leave a church? Well, number one, uh, I would say if it's a cult. Okay. So you can't leave, right? You're not allowed to leave. The person that is preaching or the person leading um, is twisting the word of God in order to make it feel like um, they're the only ones that actually hear from him. Okay. So here's how you can tell. Um, cause I grew up in a cult. So this is how I can tell you. We were constantly told, and I was young at the time, but my parents were constantly told, you don't need to hear from Jesus. You hear from Jesus through me. That's the place that you hear from God. Now, if you get anything like that, right? I'm not talking about thus saith the Lord, someone gave you a prophecy. If someone is directly saying or inferring that only they can hear from God for you, then you're likely in a cult, (laughs) okay? So it's time for you to leave. That's usually the first sign of control in a church, right? Where people can't hear from God for themselves. Uh, The cult leader is getting involved, um, overly involved in personal finances and marital relationships, right? All those things have this effect of um, controlling people's entire lives and the entire microcosm around it. You're not allowed to have friends outside the church or it's looked down upon, right? All those things. Everything that you do is managed and controlled, right? Instead of someone with relationship with you challenging you through scripture, there's unsaid and unspoken expectations that are a constant rule hovering over your head. Now, there's some cultures that you're going to step into that are hotter than others. That's not what I mean. What I mean is someone is trying to control the relationships all around you and in your life. Now, if someone comes to you and you're like sleeping with your girlfriend and living with her and you're living in sin and an elder in the church or the pastor challenges you, that's biblical. Okay. (laughs) That's not what I mean. Oh, they're just trying to control me. It's like, stop sinning, idiot. Like that's what the that's what the eldership and the leaders in your church are there for, right? I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about peripheral things. Okay? If they're controlling peripheral things in your life, then you're likely in a cult and you need to leave. If the next thing, you're a part and this is a cult as well. If you're a part of a church that is woke in any sense of the term, run. Get out of that church. It's no longer a church. It's a woke cult. It's held up. It's a it's a political arm of the left. It no longer belongs to the body of Christ. They're apostate and they don't belong to him. And watch this sneak into your church, right? If someone's making you feel guilty, no matter what the color of your skin is, if someone is making you feel guilty for the color of your skin, right? That's not scriptural. (laughs) If someone is making you guilty, feel guilty for success in life, that's not scriptural. They should be encouraging you to be generous with your wealth, not making you guilty for being successful, unless your success was made in sin. In that case, you need to repent and get rid of it. If you're being told, right, in any in any sense of the term, that homosexuality now is normal, that attending gay weddings is totally fine, that transgenderism is something we need to understand and support, that teaching children sexuality at a very young age is important, or they're connected to organizations that do that, Um, A lot of this is connected to sex, by the way, guys, um, in the end, right? But what you have is a Marxist church. You don't have a church anymore. And I I hesitate to even call it a church. What you have is a Marxist arm of a political movement that's been taught in universities for the last 30 or 40 years. You no longer have a church. That is apostate. Leave. Get out of there. Get your family out of there. Run away as fast as you can because it is a cult and you'll find out it's a cult as soon as you tell people you're going to leave or if you disagree with something that's said that is a main um that is a main and core or pillar belief of that movement right their priests will punish you they'll excommunicate you right they'll remove you okay they'll tell you they're hearing from god on this 
If anyone tells you that God changes or God changes his mind when it comes to scripture, leave, get out of that church, run away. Okay. It doesn't matter if it's woke. If anyone ever says that, get out of that church, leave quietly, right? With a blessing, right? Bless your enemies, but get out of that church, right? Things you don't leave for lack of opportunity. They're not giving me enough opportunity. The pastor doesn't understand my gifting. Well, maybe you're just a weirdo and you got to work on some stuff. And maybe if you're a success just outside of church in normal life, you could fix your bed, clean your room, keep your house in order. Then someone could look at you as a leader within your church as well, right? You're called to something. You need to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Paul the Apostle says that. Lack of opportunity is not a reason you leave. Being challenged with your behavior is not a reason you leave. Worship wasn't up to par. The musicians aren't good enough. Not a reason you leave. You worship with all your heart. And I've learned to do this, right? Not just in our church, because worship has improved drastically in our church, (laughs) right? Since we started. But no matter where I go, right? We have speaking engagements. And sometimes worship is horrendous, right? But I learn that it's about him and it's not about me, right? How I feel about worship doesn't matter. Your pastor isn't the best preacher in the world. Stop comparing your pastor to Stephen Furtick and T.D. Jakes. What I mean is uh, social media and YouTube have created a vertical comparison economy for you. Like, let's say like you live in a small town and you're like an eight out of 10 good looking person in your town, right? Soon as you hop on Instagram, you're like a four out of 10, right? Because all the best looking people in the world are posting and people are following them because they're good looking. Don't look at a church through the eyes of Instagram or social media alone, right? It can draw you in. It can be their front door. That's what we use it for. But don't compare your pastor to them. Look at his life. Look at how he's living. Look at his family. Look at his wife. Is she well-loved, right? Is she she well-loved? Is she well taken care of? Are his kids mostly obedient, right? Are his kids good kids, right? Is he disciplined in life, right? Is he disciplined with his money? Is he disciplined with his body? Right. Look at how he lives, because you'll learn far more from a pastor in the long term about how he lives his life than a message on Sunday. I bet you you can't remember the best message you've ever heard. You're like, that was so good from three weeks ago in your church. But you know who your pastor is and you know who the people are in your life that have impacted you. You can immediately say five people that impacted you in your life for better, for worse, and remember how they did it, because it's the relationships that actually matter. It's not a reason to leave a church. You don't agree with where the money's being spent. Now, I'm not talking about anti-biblical stuff. I'm not talking about them supporting like Pride Week or something like that in your city. What I mean is if your pastor decides to have a building fund, if your pastor decides to give a bunch of money away to the homeless and you had a different homeless ministry you liked better or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or um, how they pay the staff, right? If they're not, if they're paying, paying the staff too much in your opinion or whatever it is, what happened in the book of Acts is really interesting. They would take the money that they sold from property and lay it at the apostles feet. Do you know what the people that laid at the apostles feet did after that? Nothing. <laughs> they did nothing. Look to your own finances first. Most of the time when people are complaining about where the money in a church is going, they're rarely tithing and their own finances aren't in order. I'll listen to someone that has their stuff in order. I will. And we do all the time. We make adjustments with our finances in our church all the time to be more transparent, to do them more down the line, to spend money in the right places, to steward it well, right? Money should be stewarded well. It shouldn't be wasted because it's tithe money. Right? It's other people's money they're investing in the kingdom. But that's not a reason to leave just because you disagree with something that the pastor's doing as long as it's scriptural, okay? What a church looks like, its style, all those things, none of that stuff matters. Did God call you to a body of believers in order to invest in the body of believers? Here's why most people end up leaving churches for the wrong reasons, because they think the church is about them. Until you realize that you were placed in a church to give, what are your spiritual gifts for? It says in Corinthians, for the edification of the body. You are in your church right now in order to give. Give the most you possibly can. Give all you possibly can. And if you have to leave because of rank heresy or because something's going horribly wrong or there's some kind of scandal in your church, they should be sorry you're leaving, right? 
They should be sorry you're leaving. If you're the person that they're like, oh, thank God, the pastor is like, solved a problem for me. That they left, <laughs> like, I feel bad for you because you're just going to do it at the next church you go to. You're going to do it over and over and over again, right? So to, to summarize, just really quickly, find a church. First, be prayerful about that church. Make sure that worship is central. Worship of Jesus and Jesus alone. <laughs> okay, nothing else. Nothing added. <laughs> right? Jesus alone. Make sure the gospel is being preached. People are being saved. That miracles are happening. And if miracles aren't happening yet in your church, be that miracle. Be the person. There's all kinds of different miracles that can take place. But be the person that draws a circle around yourself and says, if my church isn't going to have revival, I'm going to have revival here. and I'm going to bring it to people and I'm going to love on them as much as I possibly can. All right. The preaching of the gospel from the word. They follow the word as closely as humanly possible with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Right. And they're equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. For what? For the work of the ministry. And that's whatever you're called to in life. Right. For the work of spreading the kingdom of heaven that Jesus preaches through all four gospels, spreading the kingdom message, which is Jesus died on the cross he was crucified for our sins. He was raised from the dead on the third day, right? Visited with his apostles and with his followers for 40 days, then ascended to heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf, and he's coming back. That's a really, really short version of the gospel, but you need to hear that in church, all right? Make sure you go to church this Sunday, all right? Stop shopping and start finding.